Looking for magic cards or magic carps? TCG Player has all the singles you need to upgrade your decks. Import a list with mass entry and let the card optimizer do the rest. Use my affiliate link down below when shopping and you'll be supporting the channel at the same time. Hello everyone and welcome to another installment of turning popular franchises into magic cards using artificial intelligence. Today we are taking a look at The Lord of the Rings, which also happens to be a real upcoming expansion next year through the universes beyond, so maybe artificial intelligence will give us a glimpse into the future, or at the very least give us a good chuckle. I've prepared a list of about 50 characters from the beloved series, and I've assigned them mana cost and card types, which the AI will take into account when generating cards. These mana costs and types are of course entirely subjective, but through meticulous research, <coughs> rewatching the entire extended edition trilogy, I've tried my best to stay true to every character. So let's dive right into it and in alphabetical order. Aragorn, also known as Strider, was a great ranger and warrior who would eventually become the King of Gondor. I've chosen green-white for his colors and human ranger as creature type. A 2-2 with first strike and vigilance and landfall saying whenever Aragorn, leader of the Aravans, and a knight enters the battlefield under your control, you may have target creature get plus two plus two until end of turn. Well, could potentially synergize with the Knights of Rohan, as we'll see in a little bit. The art's not bad, and if we maybe fix the landfall ability, it could be a pretty decent design overall. Next up we have Andoril, Flame of the West, a legendary artifact equipment, as it's the reforged sword wielded by Aragorn. Okay, Andoril is 2 mana to equip, giving plus 2 plus 0 and haste, so it seems quite fitting with the name of the card. I would probably expect a little bit more out of a legendary equipment especially, so we can maybe increase the plus 2 plus 0 to plus 2 plus 2 for instance, maybe toss in an extra keyword, but the overall design makes sense and reminds me a little bit of the Sword of War and Peace cycle of equipment, so we can probably increase the power level slightly. Next up is Arwen, the half-elven daughter of Elrond. She married Aragorn and united elves and men while giving up her immortality. I chose blue, white and green for her colors and of course a human elf. A 2-2 saying as long as it's equipped, other elves you control get plus one plus one and have hexproof. So it seems like a relatively powerful but still balanced ability. The opponent can still take out Arwen and the flavor text is pretty funny. In the Lanowar, all fairies are fair. Next is Azog the Defiler, a skillful orc warrior, chieftain of Moria. He started the war between dwarves and orcs and shown to be very bloodthirsty, so black red to its core. Azog turned into a 4-4 with Menace, and whenever it deals combat damage to a player, choose one, either gain control of target creature with power 2 or less until end of turn, or destroy target creature with power 2 or less. Pretty interesting design, Menace makes a lot of sense on Azog, the power and toughness also seems quite fitting, and the ability could play well in like a red-black sacrifice deck, so it gets a thumbs up from me. Next is Bilbo Baggins, a hobbit of the Shire, and also the burglar in the quest of Erebor, which is why I gave it the halfling rogue creature type, and also one of the many ring bearers of the One Ring, so I give it the white and then blue-green hybrid color, because Bilbo does have that additional curiosity that a regular hobbit doesn't really have, so that's where the blue comes in. There we have Bilbo, a 2-2, saying when it enters a battlefield, put a plus one plus one counter on the target creature you control. This is certainly an ability we've seen before on 2-drops, typically the creature is a 1-1, as you can put the counter on itself and turn it into a 2-2, but I guess because it's multicolor we get a slightly better version, stapled onto a 2-2. So a decent card, although there's not quite the connection I was hoping for with the rogue part of the card, but still a nice card overall. Next up we have Sting, a large elvish dagger, which functioned well as a sword for the hobbits Bilbo and Frodo Baggins, so I made it a legendary artifact and it's relatively cheap, as it's just an elvish dagger after all. Sting costs 1 mana to equip, and the equipped creature gets plus 1 plus 1 and can tap to deal 1 damage to any target. That's a very powerful effect, especially if you can combine it with a Death Touch creature for instance, you could take out any opposing creature with the one Death Touch damage, so it's probably a little bit under costed as it is, would probably make it cost a bit more, and I would probably associate it more with like a bow and arrow or maybe a slingshot as opposed to an elfish dagger, 
but the idea is certainly nice to put this on an equipment. Next up is Frodo Baggins, and they've already revealed the art for Frodo in the upcoming Universes Beyond expansion, so we can have a look at it. Of course, Frodo is Bilbo's nephew and also a ring bearer who played the leading role in the Quest of the Ring. His curiosity of the outside world, fascination with elves and faraway places did not fit the general personality of most hobbits, which is why we've also added the blue collar here, and he was also very kind and compassionate, so I chose to go with the same colors as Bilbo and also a halfling, this time just just a citizen instead of a rogue. Frodo turned into a 2-2 with Flash, and when it enters the battlefield you may return target artifact card from your graveyard to your hand. So a pretty powerful 2-drop, and I can kind of see the connection with the one ring perhaps as an artifact you could get back. So there's a bit of a thematic connection with the story as well, which is nice. So yeah, Frodo seems like a fine card overall. Next up is Tom Bombadil, a bit of a controversial character, but described as a very ancient and powerful being. His true race is unknown, but he's also described as the master of wood, water and hill, which is why I went with blue, red and green for his colors, and then Avatar seems quite emblematic for these ancient powerful beings. So that's what we're going for here. Alright, there's Tom, a 6-6 with haste, and when Tom enters the battlefield, if it was kicked for 4 mana, it deals 3 damage to each creature with flying. Wow, a 4 mana 6-6 with haste is quite powerful. And then the kicker ability, I don't really see the connection with the character, but I guess it's just a nice ability on top. So certainly a powerful card for a powerful figure. Next up is Boromir, a valiant warrior of Gondor and the eldest son of Denethor II and the older brother of Faramir. And I think red-white fits his personality perfectly. Alright, there's Boromir, and the art's quite interesting. They might want to pan up a little bit instead of focusing on the crotch area. But a 3-2 that when it enters the battlefield, it deals 1 damage to each creature and each player. So kind of your Goblin Chain Whirler effect, but it affects both players. So quite fitting on a human warrior, I suppose. But a 3-2 feels a little bit small for this legendary creature, so it might maybe bump it up to like a 4-3 at the very least. Next we have Merry, another hobbit of the Shire, and one of Frodo's cousins and closest friends. He's described as warm-hearted and naively brave. So I went with the Naya colors for Merry. Not sure which hybrid I should choose here, but I went with the white and then a red-green hybrid and another halfling citizen. Mary turned into a 2-2 that when it enters the battlefield lets us search our library for a legendary creature card, reveal it and put it into our hand. So Mary can find all his friends, including Eowyn perhaps, which is part of his adventure. So it makes a lot of sense thematically and gets a thumbs up. Our next creature is not very well known, but Kerkroth, also known as the Red Maw, was the greatest werewolf that ever lived. And of course, werewolves in magic are typically red-green. There's Kerkroth, a 3-3 with first strike, saying we may cast creature spells as though they had flash. And this is actually a very useful ability in a werewolf tribal deck in magic, as you often want to pass the turn, let it transform to knight, even with the original werewolves, and then be able to play creatures in the opponent's turn still. So this fits a werewolf tribal deck perfectly, even though maybe a 3-3 is a bit on the small side for a legendary werewolf, could probably bump it up to a 4-4. Next up we have Denethor II, the last ruling steward of Gondor and the father of Boromir and Faramir, and I've decided to go with a white black for his colors, as he's not the most well-liked guy and human noble as creature type. Alright, there's Denethor, a 2-2, and for one, a white and a black, we can gain two life. So maybe fits in your black-white life gain synergy decks, I suppose. Feels a bit tame for a 3-mana legendary creature, but I guess it fits his character and also reminds me of that scene in the movie where he obliterates that tomato. Play that sound effect whenever you activate his ability. Durin's Bane was a Balrog of Morgoth that lay beneath the depths of the Dwarven Kingdom and was eventually slain by Gandalf. And we already got a preview for the art in the upcoming Universes Beyond. Black Red seems very fitting for this expensive demon. Durin's Bane turned into a 6-6 with haste, saying when it deals combat damage to a player, that player discards a card, which seems like a very reasonable ability on a Black Red demon. 
I would maybe replace haste with both flying and trample to make it a little bit more balanced as haste on a 6-6 six -six seems quite powerful, but uh, overall you could easily print this card and no one would bat an eye. Then we have Elrond, the half-elven Lord of Rivendell, a skillful warrior in battle, and he also commanded various elven armies, made him a human elf advisor for his role in assembling the Fellowship of the Ring, and then blue, white and green seems fitting for colors. Elrond turned into a 2-2, saying whenever we cast a non-creature spell, create a 2-2 green elf warrior creature token. Wow, I love the design on this, and the ability kind of fits all three colors nicely. We've got the blue caring about non-creature spells, and then green making an elf, and white also happy making tokens usually. So this card seems totally fine to print as is, although I could see modifying the power and toughness, making it slightly bigger, but typically cards like this tend to be on the smaller side, as you want opponents to be able to kill it pretty easily. Eomer was a man of Rohan and the eventual 18th King of Rohan, a place famous for its horses, and if you're riding a horse in magic, you're often a knight as creature type. He also possessed a great passion and was considered a valiant warrior and a decent man, so red-white seems like a fitting color here. There's Eomer, a 2-2, saying other creatures you control get plus one plus one, so a nice anthem effect. And for one, a white and a red, we can tap him to exile target creature card from a graveyard. Don't really see the connection with exiling graveyards and Eomer's character, but giving other creatures plus one plus one seems perfect, as Eomer can be an inspiring leader when he's in battle. Next is Eowyn, which is Eomer's sister and also the niece of King Theoden. She disguised herself as a man and traveled with the riders of Rohan, carrying with her the hobbit Mary, and she eventually slayed the witch king. So similar to Eomer, also red-white and a human knight. Okay, there we have Eowyn, a 2-2 with a first strike and has morph for two, a white and a red. Now bear with me, Morph actually is a genius ability to put on Eowyn, because she puts on a disguise to fight among the riders of Rohan. So I think Morph actually works here, but we probably need to fine-tune some of the power and toughness and mana costs to make this a more viable card, but I love the idea of putting Morph on this. Then we have Faramir, the second son of Denethor and younger brother of Boromir. He was captain of the rangers of Ithilien, described as fair-minded, scrupulously just, and very merciful, the character that a writer Tolkien identified with the most. So I chose blue, white and green for his colors, and of course a human ranger. There's Faramir, a 2-2, saying whenever Faramir attacks, draw a card. This could actually work, especially if you can give him some form of evasion, either flying or unblockable, seems worth building around, and fits kind of the blue, green and white colors nicely as well, so it gets a thumbs up. Galadriel, also known as the Lady of the Woods, was one of the greatest elves in Middle-earth. She surpassed nearly all authors in beauty, knowledge and magical powers, so I made her a blue-green elf wizard. And there's Galadriel, a 2-4, saying when Galadriel choose target creature you control, its power and toughness are each equal to the number of lands you control. Alright, so we probably have to rephrase this to when Galadriel enters a battlefield, choose target creature but kind of like the ability, having a 2-4 that can maybe upgrade a different creature into having power and toughness equal to the number of lands is pretty nice and can maybe synergize with flicker effects so you can keep upgrading some other creatures. So yeah, kind of a neat design for a blue-green creature for sure. Next up we have Sam, Frodo's gardener and best friend, proved himself to be the most loyal of the Fellowship of the Ring and played a critical role in protecting Frodo and destroying the One Ring made him a green-white halfling citizen. And there's Sam, a 2-2 with Vigilance, and whenever Sam attacks, choose one, you either gain one life, or return target creature card with mana value 3 or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. Wow, I love everything about this card, all the way from the art to the flavor text. Life is a relic that I must keep safe, fits his character perfectly, Vigilance also quite fitting, having to keep an eye on Frodo and maybe being able to get back Frodo from the graveyard when he attacks, so this card is just perfection. Gandalf the Grey was a wizard sent to Middle-earth to fight Sauron, he helped form the Fellowship of the Ring and is noteworthy for his keen interest in hobbits. We already got a preview image from the upcoming set and this was one of the harder cards to pin down. I eventually settled on blue, white and green for his colors but could easily add red into the mix and for creature type I just went with wizard, although they might end up adding the Maya creature type for him and a few other cards. 
And there's Gandalf, a 2-2, saying as spells you cast cost one generic mana less to cast, and whenever you cast a non-creature spell, draw a card. This seems very powerful as kind of a storm slash combo enabler, making things cheaper and drawing cards in the process. Seems like a dangerous card to print as is, but I guess it makes sense for Gandalf to be very powerful. And after the battle with Durin's Bane, Gandalf was taken by the darkness, but he was sent back to mortal lands and resurrected with renewed strength as Gandalf the White. So this is just three and double white for another legendary wizard. There's Gandalf the White, a 3-3 that when it enters a battlefield, exiles all artifacts and enchantments. This could be very impactful in a game of multiplayer, I imagine, and having this kind of purifying effect, I guess, fits the White character a little bit. Gimli was the only dwarven member of the Fellowship of the Ring and became fast friends with Legolas the Elf, and dwarves are typically red in magic and fits Gimli perfectly. There's Gimli, a 2-2, saying if a creature you control would deal damage to a permanent or player, it deals double that damage to that permanent or player instead. So a very powerful effect, often seen on more expensive enchantments, although this one specifically only applies to creatures, still means Gimli essentially attacks for 4, which is also very powerful and definitely a very fitting ability. Maybe a little bit too powerful on a 3-drop, but uh, at least a 2-2 is not too difficult for the opponent to take out, and it doesn't increase its toughness, so it kind of forces the opponent to trade and keep some creatures back. Next up we have Golem, another pretty complicated character, originally a type of hobbit, but his life extended far beyond his nature by the effects of possessing the One Ring. His only goal was to repossess the ring at all costs, and keen-eyed and quick of hand, he was great at not being seen turned him into a halfling rogue, and Grixis colors seemed fitting, as he does kind of check all those different boxes. And there we have Golem, a 2-2, saying a Golem cannot be blocked by creatures with power 2 or less. So fitting ability on kind of a sneaky creature that wants to attack unopposed, but I would maybe word it slightly differently, maybe up it to power 3 or less at the very least, and then uh, maybe power and toughness can be changed slightly, but having this pseudo-unblockable ability makes sense to me, although we could maybe see a flip card if the expansion eventually comes out, where we have Smeagol on one side and then Golem on the other, which could also lead to some interesting design space. I've also added Goblin to the list, just a generic creature, no specific one. Tolkien described them as big, ugly creatures that lived deep under the misty mountains in many strongholds, and of course goblins are typically red and magic. Alright, there's our generic Goblin, a 1-1, and for a single red we can sacrifice Goblin to destroy target land. A very powerful effect, although between the casting cost and the ability we're still paying 3 mana total, which is the same as casting a Stone Rain, but being able to cast it for 2 mana and then activate it later makes it a bit better since we can also attack and block with it, and there may be some graveyard recursion synergies where we can keep destroying more and more lands, so probably a lot more dangerous to print than a 3 mana Stone Rain. Next up is Gorbag, an intelligent and crafty orc. He was the captain of Sirith Ungol, and he's famous for capturing Frodo. And since he is slightly more intelligent than the average orc, I've made him blue as well. Alright, there we have Gorbag, a 3-3 saying whenever Gorbag attacks, exile the top card of your library face down, you may look at it for as long as it remains exiled, and you may spend mana as though it were mana of any color to cast that card. So it's almost like drawing a card, but not quite, because it says cast instead of play, we won't be able to play lands from exile, making it worse than simply drawing. So it's not strictly better than Faramir in that regard, which is nice to see. Then I thought it would be fun to try out Grond, the wolf's head, a 100 foot long battering ram with a head in the shape of a wolf. It was created in the likeness of Kerkaroth, and makes sense to make it a legendary vehicle. And there we have Grond, although no power and toughness, so it didn't pick up on the vehicle part, but it says whenever a creature you control deals coma damage to a player, create a 2-2 green wolf creature token. So a pretty powerful ability, and it stays on theme with a wolf's head, so overall not a bad card. Next up is Gwaihir, Lord of the Great Eagles, famous for rescuing the members of the Fellowship on several occasions, and in magic, blue-white is known as the flying archetype, so seems like a great match here. 
And there's Guaihir, a 2-2 flyer, saying whenever Guaihir attacks, create a 2-2 white bird creature token with flying. So it's like it's summoning additional great eagles, which is quite flavorful. A 2-2 seems a little bit small for Guaihir himself, so it would probably crank it up to at least a 3 or a 4 powered creature, but I like the ability very much. Next up we can try a land. Casa Doom, commonly known as Amoria, was an underground kingdom beneath the Misty Mountains and was the most famed of all the Dwarven realms, and as a Dwarven land makes sense for it to be a mountain. Alright, there we have Casa Doom, enters the battlefield tapped, but can tap to make double red, so very powerful, can even fetch it up as it does have the mountain type, so we probably have to get rid of that to make it somewhat printable, but probably still too powerful as a land that doesn't have a ton of drawbacks, making two mana. The King of the Dead was cursed, and his spirit resided along with that of his followers in the paths of the dead. They could not rest until their oath was fulfilled, which is why they joined Aragorn during the War of the Ring. Turned him into a 5-mana, black-white, legendary spirit noble, as he reminds me of Obzidant, the Ghost Council. Alright, there's our King of the Dead, a 2-2 flyer, and for 2 and triple black, target player gains control of target creature for as long as you control King of the Dead. So if you can protect your king, then you can start stealing the opponent's creatures over and over again until they run out and you basically kill them with their own army, which seems quite flavorful, but a 2-2 is pretty easy for the opponent to take out. Legolas was Mirkwood's prince, a messenger and a master archer. He was well known for becoming friends with the dwarf Gimli, despite their long-held differences, and of course a perfect green elf archer. And there's Legolas, a 2-3 with a reach. So either we decrease the mana cost to just 2, or we increase the power and toughness slightly to make it a bit more exciting, but reach on an elf archer makes a lot of sense. Next up is Minas Tirith, the capital city of Gondor, surrounded by the plains of Pelennor Fields, so it makes for a perfect legendary plains. Alright, there's Minas Tirith, looking beautiful, and it says, start the game with this card face down as a starting card of your starting deck. Okay, let's ignore that part, and then at the beginning of each end step, each player may draw a card. Well, given that it affects both players, it seems relatively balanced, would probably need to tap to add white mana to be a land, but I kind of like the idea of having kind of this symmetrical card draw. Next is Mount Doom, a volcano in Mordor where the One Ring was forged and the only place it could be destroyed. It was the ultimate destination for Frodo and Sam in their quest of the ring, and this is also a perfect legendary mountain. There's Mount Doom, enters the battlefield tapped, can make red mana and can also sacrifice it to deal 1 damage to any target. Yeah, that seems relatively balanced for a land, maybe a bit on the powerful side, but it is legendary after all, so I could see this being printed actually. The Mouth of Sauron was one of Sauron's most devoted servants, serving as herald, messenger and even lieutenant at the time of the War of the Ring, and gave me some strong black-white cleric vibes. A 2-2 that can be sacrificed to draw three cards. Wow, this seems a little bit too powerful. Would have to be at the very least two instead of three cards, and even then it would probably be a little bit too pushed as a creature that can attack and block, can be sacrificed at any point, and maybe be recurred from the graveyard to draw even more cards but I kind of like the idea behind it. Then we have the Mumakil. These were large creatures resembling elephants, often used in battle by the Haradrim, and the hobbits prefer to call them Oliphants instead, so just a large green elephant creature. Alright, there's Mumakil, a 6-6 Trampler, and when Mumakil enters the battlefield, put three plus one plus one counters on target creature you control. So it can even put the counters on itself, making it a 9-9 Trampler. So eat your heart out, Colossal Dreadmaw, this is a definite upgrade. The Nazgul, also known as the Black Riders, or simply the Nine, were the dreaded ring servants of the Dark Lord Sauron. And during the War of the Ring, they replaced their horses with fell beasts. These were large, winged creatures without feathers, and they strongly resemble specters in the world of magic, and just four mana for a black creature specter. And there's our Nazgul, a 2-2 flyer, when it deals damage to a player, that player discards a card. So pretty much what I expected this card to be, could maybe spice it up and add an extra ability to make it more interesting, but as a specter this makes total sense. 
It's finally time for the One Ring. Secretly forged by Sauron in the heart of Mount Doom, it had the power to dominate the other 19 Great Rings, and had the powers of the other rings combined, but to a far greater extent, and had some powers uniquely its own. Decided to make this just a one-mana legendary artifact equipment, hoping that the equip cost is going to be much greater. Alright, this is interesting. Equips for 2 mana, giving plus 1 plus 1 and both protection from black and from red. So you can maybe protect Frodo from the evils of Mordor, but on the other hand, equipping the ring should come with some sort of extra drawback. So I'm not sure how to design this perfectly, but maybe associating some drawback to equipping, like having to pay life, could help make this more balanced. Rivendell was an elven town and the House of Elrond, located at the edge of a narrow gorge of a river, but well hidden in the moorlands and foothills of the Misty Mountains, so it seems like a nice blue-green dual land. Okay, there we have Rivendell. I lost the island and forest type, but we still have a land that makes colorless and can be sacrificed for 4 mana to search your library for a legendary creature card and put it onto the battlefield. Wow. If it put the creature in our hand, it would already be pretty decent, but cheating it straight onto the battlefield seems a bit overpowered. So let's assume it says put it into your hand instead, then this would still be a pretty decent land giving you a tutor effect for legendary creatures, which is also quite thematic as Rivendell was the place where all these legendary creatures basically assembled to gather the Fellowship of the Ring, so I like the flavor behind it. Then we have Saruman, the wizard's leader and chief of the White Council that opposed Sauron. His studies of dark magic, however, eventually led him to desire the One Ring and lust for power. So a pretty complicated character, has some white elements, some blue elements and some black elements, and a wizard similar to Gandalf. Saruman turned into a 2-2 and for 4 mana we can tap it and search our library for a card with mana value 1 or less and put it straight onto the battlefield and then shuffle. A little bit expensive to activate, could even just be a tap ability without any additional costs and I kind of like the idea of Saruman trying to find the one ring in your library to cheat it into play so there's a bit of flavor behind it too. And then we have Sauron, Lord of the Rings and Maker of the One Ring. Sauron became the second Dark Lord and sought to conquer Middle-earth. Black Red seems fitting and Spirit Lord for creature type, even though Lord's no longer really used in magic. Alright, there's Sauron, a 5-5, and when Sauron first strike, destroy each creature and each planeswalker. So this needs a little bit of work, but let's say Sauron just has first strike, and when he enters the battlefield, destroy each other creature and each planeswalker. That would make a lot more sense and make it a pretty powerful card. And then the flavor text is also on point. There's no shelter from the dead and no peace until death is declared. Shadowfax also deserves its own card. Chieftain of the race of the greatest horses in Middle-earth, Shadowfax was capable of comprehending human speech and was set to run faster than the wind, ridden by Gandalf the White, a green-white legendary horse. Alright, there's Shadowfax and uh, I don't think Shadowfax knows where to go as it seems to be missing ahead. But a 2-2 with Flash, maybe a reference to Shadowfax riding like the wind, because haste is not really available in green-white, so Flash may be the next best thing. And when Shadowfax enters a battlefield, create a 2-2 green knight creature token with vigilance. So 4 points of power and toughness at instant speed thanks to Flash makes this a very powerful card. Then we have Shelob, a great spider and the greatest offspring of the primordial spider. She lived on the borders of Mordor, where she was eventually encountered by Frodo and Sam in their quest to destroy the One Ring. And spiders are typically black-green in magic, so that seems fitting. And there we have Shelob, a 5-5 with a reach, and when Shelob enters the battlefield, put a plus one plus one counter on each creature you control. Yeah, very powerful ability. Would have expected there to be some sort of death touch at the very least, but just being a 5-5 I guess is big enough. Next up is Smaug, considered to be the last great dragon of Middle-earth. He was drawn to the enormous wealth amassed by the dwarves of the Lonely Mountain. Smaug is shown to be cunning, violent, cruel, arrogant and greedy, possessing an unquenchable desire for gold. Reminds me of Nicol Bolas in Magic, so the Grixis colors seem fitting here.
All right, there's Smaug, a 6-6 flyer, and when it enters the battlefield, you become the monarch. Simple yet effective, a nice reference to its greed for gold. Could probably staple some additional abilities on top for 7 mana, but I like the card. Then we have a stone troll. There are many different types of trolls, but stone trolls could speak and turned into stone during daylight, like the trolls in The Hobbit, and trolls are often red-green in magic. All right, there's our stone troll, a 2-2, saying at the beginning of your upkeep, put a plus one plus one counter on stone trolls power and toughness, as though it were countered by two target creature cards. All right, let's just simplify this to getting maybe two plus one counters at the beginning of your upkeep, and this card still seems reasonably balanced. Next up is Theoden, King of Rohan. He led 6,000 men to the aid of Gondor during the battle at Pelennor Field, bravely charging the legions of Sauron. Made him a white, legendary human noble, although you could throw a knight into the mix as well. All right, there's King Theoden, a 2-2, saying at the beginning of your upkeep, put a plus one plus one counter on each creature you control. So this will scale nicely into the late game and also fits the character of Theoden when he gives his speech to rally the troops. So I like this card. Next up is Peregrine Took, more commonly known as Pippin. He was one of Frodo's youngest and closest friends. He was a cheerful, if not sometimes thoughtless hobbit and seemingly had a knack for doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. So we've also gone with the Naya color combination, this time a white-green hybrid and then red for a halfling citizen. Okay, there's Pippin, a 1-1, one, one, and then for one a white we can tap it to search your library for a basic land card, reveal it, and put it into our hand. So kind of like the Weathered Wayfarer, except we can only find basic lands and it's a bit more expensive, so could probably fine-tune some of the numbers here to make it a bit more powerful, but I love the flavor text here. To save the world, we must take every little step in a direction that brings us closer to it. So the perfect flavor text on The Hobbit. Next is Treebeard, another fan favorite, and the oldest of the ants left in Middle-earth. An ancient tree-like being who was shepherd of trees made him quadruple green for legendary tree folk. All right, there's Treebeard, a 6-6, six, six, and then for two and triple green we can monstrosity it, putting three plus one plus one counters on it, and as long as Treebeard, I assume, is monstrous, it has trample. So it starts out as a 6-6 six, six for four mana, which is quite reasonable for quadruple green, and then when Treebeard gets angry, like in the story, he will get three additional counters, turning into a 9-9 nine, nine trampler. So a totally fine card, and the flavor text also a home run here. Some have the confidence to stand alone, others are so stubborn that they cannot get support. Then we have Ugluk, a leader of the Urukai, who were sent from Isengard to pursue the Fellowship. Urukai are brutal warriors and the strongest type of orc, bred by Saruman the White in the pits of Isengard. And I made this a black-red legendary orc mutant. Not sure if Urukai are a crossbreed of humans and orcs, so that's why I went with mutant instead. Okay, there we have Ugluk, a 4-4, saying other creatures you control get plus 1 plus 0, which also seems quite fitting, as maybe like a Rakdos Anthem effect doesn't quite pump the toughness, but certainly inspires others to attack for more damage. The Watcher in the Water was a horrifying and mysterious beast with many tentacles, living in a stagnant lake near the West Gate of Moria, made it a legendary kraken for 7 mana, including triple blue, as that strongly resembles the depiction in the movie at least. A 6-6 six, six with flash and flying, and when it enters a battlefield, exile target creature an opponent controls until Watcher leaves the battlefield. I like the removal ability on this huge kraken, don't know if it really needs flying, and flash is also a little strange, could maybe use something like an unblockable ability, or shroud or hexproof, or even just a ward to help protect it, but I like the effect of removing a creature when it enters. Then we have the Witch King himself, leader of the Nazgul and Sauron's second in command. His true identity is unknown. Once a mortal king of men, he was corrupted by one of the nine rings of power, made him a six mana legendary specter similar to the Nazgul. 
Alright, there's our Witch King, a 4-4 flyer, and when it deals combat damage to a player, we may exile a card from our graveyard. If we do create a token, that's a copy of that card. So it's kind of like a pseudo reanimation effect, which can be quite powerful on a 4-4 flyer that doesn't have too much trouble attacking and hitting the opponent. Don't quite see the connection with the character of the Witch King, as it's not really known for reanimating a ton of creatures, but overall a decent card. Then we have the Warg, a breed of giant, intelligent, and malevolent wolves who lived in the Misty Mountains. Some were captured and used by orcs of Isengard and Mordor, others had an allegiance with the goblins instead. These seem quite junt-like, so black, red, and green. Alright, there's Warg, a 3-3 with Menace, could probably benefit from Haste as well, but I like the simplicity here. And last but not least, we have a Grima Wormtongue chief counselor at the court of King Theoden of Rohan, before being exposed as an agent and mole of the corrupted wizard Saruman, made him a blue-black human advisor. Alright, there's Grima, a 1-1 that when it enters the battlefield makes each opponent a discard a card. Could probably add a little bit of an extra ability on top, as we're paying a blue and a black instead of one and a black, which is typical for these 1-1s that make the opponent a discard, but the design makes a lot of sense. Alright, that's gonna wrap things up for today's video. Some of my favorite designs included Kerkroth, Elrond, Sam was probably the best one overall, Shadowfax another fun one, and Treebeard was also perfect. So a lot of great designs, but let me know in the comments if I've missed any important characters, and I might cover them in a future episode. But for now, I wanna thank you for watching, hope you enjoyed, and as always, have a nice day! I also wanna thank all my patrons for being part of the channel, and you can become a patron yourself today and decide the topic of future videos over at patreon.com forward slash legendvd.